Well, what do you think of my Wi-Fi network name? <laughs> Hey everybody, so this is going to be a Me Too video. Um, what do I mean by Me Too? Uh, well, uh, you know, back when we started traveling in the Airstream, I had these visions of, you know, digging into the backwoods, really getting off grid, and, uh, you know, we're, we're entering our sixth year now of travel, and What's materialized really is, you know, I do work remotely and I do write software, so I need connectivity all the time for work. And so we've we've ended up principally really camping around kind of the, the edges of connectivity, right? Like find out where Verizon or AT&T has coverage and uh, that's where we stay. So, you know, it's, it's hardly an unfulfilling existence. We've had a wonderful time in our Airstream. Um, but I have noticed over um, the past year or so, I've, I've seen more and more uh, Starlink dishes appearing on people next to me, and I keep thinking, me too, <laughs> I want to do that also. Um, so uh, we finally, this, uh, this year, we finally had the opportunity, kind of the finances to pull this off. Um, so this video is a me too video because um, it's gonna be all about putting um, a Starlink dish on the Airstream here and I would uh, like to do a shout out, we, you know, credit where credit due, right? Um, Gander Flight was uh, very, very uh, influential for me when we were putting together a list of parts uh, to do this. So um, what we're gonna talk about today um, is, you know, how are we gonna get uh, the dish on the Airstream? What kind of mounting options are we presented with? Um, and, um, you know, once we get the dish up and working, you know, we're gonna initially, we're just gonna run the wire through the door. We're, we're here at Space Flight Central, which is otherwise known as Fred's house. Um, and we're gonna just kind of bring this thing online and see that it works. And then the next part of the conversation is, um, uh, I'm not gonna go travel uh, this year, you know, with the wire running out of the door. Um, spent a plenty of time uh, looking at YouTube, looking at what others have done. And uh, I've even found videos of folks with uh, Airstreams, on what they've done. So. Um, the, the downside of the, the whole, you know, um, Starlink strategy is uh, evidently um, the dish comes with a funny shaped connector. It's, it's not uh, standard anything and so uh, it's not obvious how to get the connection from the dish into the Airstream. And so uh, I'm going to show you the choices that uh, Fred and I have made to make that happen. Um, and um, we're going to go with kind of a, a middle range option, which is as few holes as possible, as few wiring, a uh, few wiring changes as possible. Uh, and I'm going to see how it goes over the summer. Right? And if I like it, if I'm happy with it, uh, we might make some more advanced changes that would involve uh, potentially cutting um, the, uh, the Starlink cable. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about that when I show you uh, how we mount this thing up. So let's get to it. Uh, let's start putting um, a, a Starlink satellite dish on our Airstream and then we will have uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm still toying with the ideas. Um, I don't know, st Starlink, uh, Starstream, uh, Airlink, we'll, we'll see. So here we go. Literal unboxing, eh? Uh, so uh, I was inspired by Gander Flight because one of the things they went over is um, how are we going to attach the Starlink to the Airstream? And the initial decision that I've made is uh, we are not gonna go with the Starlink in motion. I have purchased the dish that sits on a pedestal of some form um, the Starlink works by, um, they, they use this technology called a beam steering. So it's a flat little dish with a bunch of little patch antennas and um, using uh, sophisticated electronics, they can actually create a, what's called a virtual beam and they can steer it, right? So the dish, the dish does not move. Um, but what does move is this, this virtual beam that they can beam up and um, actually spot on an exact satellite. Typically, my understanding is the satellite transits the sky in about four minutes. So there are many of them. So when a new satellite comes into view, the beam switches and points at the new satellite and tracks it. So for this reason, um, it's in your interest to have a good horizon line. Uh, obstructions are not um, a good thing because it will obstruct the beam as the dish is trying to communicate with the satellite. So um, what those folks uh, showed in their video, and um, we're gonna do a me too, is uh, we're gonna put up a, a mast. And this is gonna be 
um, held together by some equipment that um, we'll, we'll have a couple of options here. So I bought this uh, to, uh, both these options at WineGuard. So let's go ahead and start pulling this guy open. Um, actual first unboxing. I, I didn't even I didn't even open this stuff. So um, all right. So this this option here um, is uh, it's a receiver hitch option that um, allows you to put quote unquote you know something heavy right something heavy on this pad and then you can put a receiver hitch into this pad and you can see here there's um, space for a flagpole which we will show you in a little bit um, so my opinion is you know looking at this and fred and i took some uh, measurements and i ordered this up uh, this is sort of ish shown and the wine guard side is being used with a tire on top of it um, we're gonna see Fred and I are gonna see if we can stick uh, this under the Airstream jack uh, and that'll hold it down and then we can have the, the, um, the flagpole slash mast coming out of here and so that's what this piece is I have unpacked our wine guard multi-use mount kit so um, I should have said earlier and I will now clarify there's actually it's a kit because we have two options. Um, one option is sort of this pad, where again, like a tire or um, theoretically maybe the Airstream tongue jack mounts up uh, this receiver hitch thusly, right? And the kit comes with some little stubbies here, short little lag bolts that you can put through. And then um, we can use uh, the, um, the hitch adapter, which turns into a flagpole through here, or, uh, we don't know yet. Uh, hang tight. In a couple of seconds, you're going to find out what answer Fred and I came up with. But the other alternative is um, this could be mounted to a bumper. And uh, the, either like so or like so, Fred and I are going to map out whether this is feasible on the front of the Airstream's uh, A-frame here. We're not sure yet. But um, if it is, then this kit would mount like this. And then you have these rather long bolts um, that come through and uh, hold the whole apparatus together. So um, it, WineGuard is very clear uh, about this hitch mount um, that um, the, the flagpole portion uh, is should not be transported. Uh, in other words, um, this portion could stay on the vehicle only. Um, this part could stay on, but not the flagpole adapter when you're in motion. Um, so that's a um, that's a good little pointer there. So, uh, I don't know. Let's go figure out how we're going to use these parts and see what happens. Also from WineGuard is it's a kit that adapts a flagpole to a receiver hitch. And the, the flagpole, which uh, also uh, inspired by our, our YouTube channel that we mentioned earlier, is... Um, uh, actually just came from Harbor Freight. So we're going to show you how um, we can place that flagpole inside this adapter and see how it mounts up. Okay, this is the wine guard hitch mount. Got it pulled out of its rather voluminous plastic packaging for a chunk of metal. And you can see that the flagpole is going to go in here. Um, so for now, I'm just going to dry mock these guys um, just so at least we have the bolts in. And this will prevent the pole from flopping around. And came with one washer. Okay, so this is mocked out and uh, we'll mate it up with uh, its um, mounting options. This video will be a little bit out of order, but uh, Fred and I have just discovered that um, I thought this was more of a bumper mount and um, it turns out it will also mount onto a frame rail which you can see here and so I'm delighted by that because we don't need to do any special tricks but um, you can see here that in our dry mocking uh, just having this mocked up just for uh, a little while we've already nicked the paint and that's one of the things that super annoys me about frame rail mounted stuff like these weight distribution hitches so uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, just put a little strip of flex seal right around the rail. Uh, obviously this wouldn't work on a load bearing system. Um, this would just squish out, but 
this isn't hardly load bearing at all. It just prevents the um, the mast from moving back and forth. And uh, so I'm I'm going to wrap the uh, frame in a little bit of this flex seal, and we'll go from there. Now I won't scrape the crap out of the airstream. Okay. All right, now I can tighten her up. Well, I was sure this would be metric, but it's not, it's standard. So we have a 9 sixteenths here to tighten the sucker up. So, and again, I mean, Fred and I aren't sure what the Newton meter torque rating is for these, but I can't imagine it's very much because it, it doesn't carry very much load. And our wing nut. So another thank you to Ganderflight. Seriously, um, uh, I'm so amazed um, at how resourceful RVers are. Um, there's lots of products for RVs, but there's also lots of hacks, right? This is one of those. So um, they point out on their website, this company called Remotely Connected, and they make a three-dimensional di three printed part for I don't know, 20 bucks. This is the part. And if you're not familiar with what 3D printers are, it's like printing a sheet of paper, but once they've printed it, it comes up in the Z dimension and they print more and you come up in the three dimension and it prints plastic. So uh, what this remotely connected has done is they make an adapter for a very, very common part. This is a 20 foot telescoping flagpole from Harbor Freight. I think it was about $70. And what they make is a little adapter, purpose built, where you can pop out the top of your flagpole here and you can take this specially printed part. And you notice here that there are um, a couple of holes for holding in um, the old top here. The, this part has been adapted, so it has holes also. And they printed it that way beautifully. And what you can do is you can push this adapter in and it um, makes for an exact snap-in cup for holding the Starlink antenna. So now we have, instead of a flagpole, we have a mast. And allow me to demonstrate the flagpole. Um, I noticed on uh, on the website when I was watching uh, their YouTube channel, there wasn't much discussion about these little doohickeys, but uh, uh, we'll decide if we want these lanyards to perhaps uh, tame the Starlink cable. Fred and I will we'll make that a game time decision. But so the flagpole um, extends thusly, and you can just kind of use these cams to just kind of turn it in a counterclockwise direction and they lock and it's extraordinarily tall now imagine you're doing this with a starlink antenna which we will be doing momentarily and for scale here we are up against the airstream And momentarily, we are going to put this into the wine guard hitch adapter. Mm -hmm. 
Ayan. Okay, so let's do another unboxing. Let's open up. It's time to get the actual dish out now that we have our mounting options ready outside for it. So the the equipment cost it was roughly um, I think it was six hundred dollars, and I got the RV plan. What made it financially viable for us is it's a hundred and thirty-five dollars a month, but it's pausable, and so you can pause the service for the portion of the year you're not using it. Also, I haven't even hooked this up yet, and they just raised the price to a hundred and fifty dollars a month. So thanks, guys. But we can still make it work. Okay, so um, evidently they call this Dishy McFlatface, is what they <laughs> call this. Um, now this is a ground mounted option that uh, gives you a pedestal that likely we won't use, but you never say never, so this will go with us too. Okay, so we have our dish. Now the dish is motorized so that when it's at its deployed position, it will go flat. Um, and then the dish can do beam steering as we've discussed. Okay, and here we have a little very, very Apple-like unboxing experience. Plugging one connector into the dish and then plugging the other end of the connector to the router. And I would argue a pretty attractive router. I'm thinking those are a wink, wink, nudge, nudge to their orbital mechanics for their satellite constellation. So I think it's a pretty, that's pretty attractive, I would say. So that's their router and Power cord for said router goes there. And finally, the big controversy. Look at that ugly thing. So this is what makes people crazy, not just in the RV community, but it does make people crazy in the RV community. Um, how the heck do you get this out of your trailer? And I will cover that with Fred momentarily, but um, my reading seems to indicate that this is called a Cat5e PoE cable. It's a Cat5e shielded ethernet cable, and PoE means it's power over ethernet. Um, I believe from my reading, the dish roughly consumes about 97 watts of power. Um, so the other end of this connector is on the dish. Um, we will show you when we decide how to run the wiring um, what the other end looks like. But uh, that's going to be the next portion of this video is after we, we're going to hook this up, we're going to see it work. And then when we see it work and we have confirmation that all the equipment is functional, we are going to tackle um, running this wire to some place in the Airstream. Hideous connector A goes into Dishy, and we are now going to place Dishy into its, it's your home. You hear that satisfying click? Um, that was the remotely connected 3D printed part that has adapted this dish. So um, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to...
Fred and I are speculating. Everything is environmentalized, even the power connector. So we haven't actually read any instructions because I don't see any, but um, we're speculating maybe you could actually run this whole thing outside. We're not sure. So Fred and I were so into the moment on the setup, uh, I, I forgot to take any um, any videos. So I managed a few screenshots, but um, uh, the the setup was I'm not exactly sure it was intuitive. Fred and I were looking around. There was no documentation on the box whatsoever, so we assumed you would go to the Starlink app, and that turns out that's the way it went. So the way it works is you turn on the app, uh, pairs up with the open Starlink um, Wi-Fi. It asks you to pick a new Wi-Fi name. Um, then you reconnect to that new Wi-Fi name. And um, at that point, uh, the dish said it was about 20 minutes, I think. It took uh, an update, and then it spent some time calibrating, and then it came online. So the setup was uh, pretty darn easy. And uh, here we are, um, streaming down uh, our own uh, channel. So we did, did our dry mock, which is cable running through the door, but we just wanted to make sure all this equipment worked. So um, we have the, um, the router here running out the door, powering the dish. The dish is up there flopping around in the breeze. And uh, you can have a couple of jokers here have been making YouTube videos. And um, I'm presently streaming this down uh, right through Starlink. So um, decided to name the network Starstream. So, um, and uh, if we do real quick, um, we'll do a quick speed test here. And we'll see how this comes out so more than enough to uh, for me to work way more than enough to stream movies HD content and CCAT videos so um, we're up and running so next we can uh, we can move on to we know the equipment works we can move on to how we are gonna get this Starlink cable outside we did look up um, whether uh, the Starlink system, including the router, can be fully contained outside because it is Wi-Fi. Um, turns out the answer is it is environmentalized to a degree. You can go to Starlink's website and this can be run outside. Um, but uh, as an engineer, an electrical engineer, uh, at least by schooling, this to me doesn't seem like a great solution. I don't want my equipment outside, especially my router. Um, and uh, another reason you might want your router inside is uh, the Starlink router um, it does not have a hard port. So uh, modern routers have all kinds of useful things like VPN and uh, parental controls. So uh, if you want to use your own router with the Starlink hardware, they do make an adapter uh, where you can plug in a, a cable here and then it splits out and it gives you uh, an Ethernet port. So um, we have to kind of make two decisions. Uh, where do I want this? And that's going to kind of guide where we're going to send the cable. Um, given that um, for now, uh, I don't care about having another router. I will eventually, um, specifically, eventually, probably we're going, we're going to let this fly for the summer and see how it goes. But um, if I do want a hard line, uh, we did have some work done in the airstream a couple of years ago to add in a really nice stereo. And the folks had added the stereo in, um, they ran this nice little um, cable tray for us that brings some of the wiring for, for the amps between this compartment here and the lower portion of the Airstream. And it runs up into this bay where I keep all of our uh, electronics. Um, I have the Wi-Fi booster up here, I have the cell booster, satellite receivers up here. So um, it would be nice if I do decide that I want a hard line, eventually I would want to get a hard line from the router up here or have the router live here, one of those two. But I don't need that today. Um, I'm gonna try and go one summer with uh, the least number of holes and the least number of cuts. So Fred and I did a little bit of scouting and what we realized is, um, so uh, the front of the Airstream is here. Um, most of the cabling for the Airstream, as it was delivered from the factory, exits under the belly pan underneath this um, sofa, which we'll show you in a minute. 
And then uh, Fred and I did some scouting and it looks like what we can do is we can bring some wire along the front of the Airstream here and into a, um, a location we discovered that holds the inverter. So I'm gonna show that to you now. And the inverter panel is right underneath this cushion. like this so I lift up this inverter panel there's a hell of a lot of space down here actually um, also just as a side note I was astonished to discover that um, it doesn't appear that the inverter panel or the inverter itself is physically screwed down <laughs> so it, it does float in here um, but uh, anyhow that's how it came from the factory but um, so let's do an experiment, a uh, thought experiment here. What if, um, what if I could put this router down there? So I'm going to position this like this and, um, it is Wi-Fi, so I don't, obviously it doesn't matter if it's not visible. Also, um, there are no lights on this router except for underneath, which you wouldn't see in its standing position anyway. So there's no value to having this router um, open to me when it's in its functioning state. And now if Fred pans around, you can see there's a bunch of cabling running out of here. And so what we're gonna try to do is we're gonna try to feed um, the Starlink cable um, around that corner. And now, if you follow me, Fred's gonna pull back. Um, underneath the sofa is the rest of the mystery. You can un open our storage panel here, um, you can see that the wiring continues right over in that corner. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna run the Starlink cable along with all this other stuff right over to about over here. And that's where we're gonna put a new hole in the belly pan and um, exit the Airstream with the Starlink cable. And then finally, how are we going to get power? I, th I think it's just kind of an ironic question. How are we gonna get power to the router when it's sitting down here next to the inverter? Because <laughs> it's the inverter's job to make power. Um, what, uh, what I've done is I've bought a low profile extension cord. It's just 16 gauge. Um, and uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just run it, plug it in here because when the sofa is placed um, uh, with the cushion in the back here, um, you'll just see a portion of that extension cord. It's flat and we're going to run the extension cord just right down, right down through this compartment like this. And um, whenever the Airstream has power or if I run the inverter and plug it into the inverter outlet, I can power the, um, the router. So um, Fred and I are going to get to work here and we're going to begin by um, seeing if our theory is right that we can feed the wire around uh, the back there like we think we can. Let's well, start feeding this around. We're going to try and follow the other wiring and then Fred's going to meet me down there, hopefully, um, with his hand. Now, if we, can't, if we can't get this to feed through, we can always use a fish tape, but, well, here we go. I see it. Hold on. Same I. Can you need a flashlight? No, no, no. Keep on move it, move it, move the line around a little bit. There it is. I got it. I got it. We finished our pull. Um, this is the amount of spare I'm going to leave. So. Uh, obviously, it seems like a little excessive for um, when the uh, router is down inside the compartment here, but what if I need to have it out for diagnostic purposes? I don't know. I could put it up along here, so I'm going to leave myself a good three or four feet here of spare.
Okay, now I'm gonna reassemble the seating area. So, I think this is very visually appealing. You can't even tell if the extension cord is there. As I said before, the router has no information on it that I need um, other than it's plugged in and we'll know from there. And should the time come when I wanna run um, a hard line from the router to get an ethernet port out of it, we can use this, um, this wiring tray. We can chase it up this wall. We can come up through here and then we could put um, a nice header right there if we need it. But uh, not today, we're gonna go minimalist. This is, this is the hole saw I'm going to use to cut through uh, the Airstream subfloor. And uh, it's just a Lenox three quarter inch hole saw bit and more than sufficient to cut through. I estimate that probably it's three quarter, I'm not sure, but certainly not inch. Um, and what we're gonna do is I've decided to come up through the belly pan into the Airstream instead of from the Airstream to the outside because I felt like if I came from the outside down through the belly pan, it might um, bloom out or create some, um, some blisters that were unappealing aesthetically, even though I don't spend very much time under my Airstream. But So also uh, Fred and I debated, um, we're not sure we could get the drill under um, all that electronics equipment there anyway, so it's easier to do it from the outside. So this is the more civilized end of the Starlink cable. And as I mentioned before, we're going to attempt a summer without cutting this cable, which we know is a Cat5e shielded Ethernet cable. Um, so we're going to drill a hole in the Airstream, feed this cable through. So the question, one of the questions becomes, now that you've drilled a hole in the Airstream, how do you environmentally seal it? So looking under the Airstream, I'll drop some uh, B-roll in here for you guys. Um, uh, I think the standard way of sealing up those holes looks like ass because it's caulking. And uh, I feel like the caulking is hard to remove. Uh, and I think it looks crappy and it attracts dirt. So I have selected this product. This is called a cable clam. So the cable clam is, it was very expensive. I think it was like $30, but it doesn't look like ass. Um, and the way this works is, um, it's a environmentally sealed solution for running cables on marine products. So you can see that the back um, has a moisture barrier and you can see that this clam uh, it screws in, so this mounts to the underside of the Airstream. And then here's the mating piece. And this doesn't require, based on the size that I purchased, this will not require cutting the cable. So um, imagine that this is coming through the floor of the Airstream. This will come on the underbelly side of the Airstream. This cable will pass through. And then, then what we're going to do is we're going to, this will pass through. <laughs> Let's make sure it fits. It fits. Okay. So, um, then on the other side, this needs to mate up with, um, this puck. And the way this works is you drill a hole in this puck to the exact size of the cable. And then it will be a little bit smaller than the cable because of the rubber. And then it's designed to slightly cinch it. So as, as you're compressing this fitting on, it will slightly compress this insert and form a moisture barrier. So um, it's environmentally sealed. It doesn't look like ass and it's all removable. All right, after the very scientific um, eyeball test, we have selected a 1764 drill bit the instructions say to pick a bit exactly the same diameter because this puck will compress. So uh, using the scientific eyeball test, we have picked a 1764th 
as the drill. So we're gonna drill a hole through this puck thusly, and then we're gonna cut it so it forms a C, and then we can clip the C around this cable, and that will form the environmental seal. Fred and I debated whether we needed a pilot hole, and we decided we didn't want a pilot hole. Furthermore, we decided uh, I didn't want to grip this with vice grips either, because I didn't want to deform the, the casing, so. Okay, we're through. Hey, that looks machine made right there. Okay, so now we have our, aha! Mm -hmm. We have our perfectly drilled, I must say that came out quite nicely actually. So now what we're supposed to do is we're gonna cut it with this Dacto blade and utility knife and that's gonna form the C. Like butter. So there we have our C. Let's go see if it fits. Well, let's see if our cut works. So once again, cable clam, hole drilled. We've now cut the um, the sealer there. So let's fit this around. So the the way I'm looking at this is um, this will be coming through the floor of the Airstream, so the cable clam will be coming in this direction, which means I want the plunger, the slightly smaller side, facing down. So, like this. And oh my gosh, it fits. So, now, I didn't put this piece on just for illustrative purposes, but this will be screwed into the underside, the underbelly of the Airstream. This cable will be feeding through like this. And then you can see there's the compression. And as we screw this piece into this piece, it will compress this fitting, creating a nice tight environmental seal. <laughs> We're under the Airstream. <laughs> so, all right. Um, so Fred and I have done some, we're gonna measure three times and cut once. So this is the original ass looking cable bundle that I'm gonna do better with the cable clam. So we've done a bunch of measuring and we feel like we can come in this direction, we can come about five inches in and then we can go two inches towards the back of the Airstream and that'll give us plenty of like open space to work with when this hole appears to feed the cable through and then to mount the uh, Cable clam plus um, the drill is not going to be in any, um, there won't be any obstructions here. So, Operation drill hole in Airstream. I'm scared. I don't want to drill hole in my Airstream. Yes, I do. I want the internet. Yeah, I see it. There's our new hole and came out nice and clean. And now on top of this, we're gonna mount our cable clam. The way this cable clammy clam is gonna work is we have our environmental seal between the mount. And so the environmental seal is gonna go on like thusly. And so I'm going to mark out some of these mounting holes. The cable clam comes with some wood screws. So I'm going to mark out the pilot holes, screw it in. That's going to be the environmental seal to the Airstream. There's our template. So I'm going to mark some holes. Then I will pilot these. Good, for sure. Yeah. I'm just gonna start 
Start okay. Go home. It's okay. Uh, how does that look? Looks good to me. And then there and now, when I tighten these down, that little this black washer is going to compress. I can really crank the crap out of this. Okay. Yeah, I can. I cannot pull the cable through yeah, anymore. So that's perfect. very good. It's environmentally sealed, and I think it's attractive looking. Mm -hmm. And now what we're going to do is we're going to run. We're going to go to the automotive store and get some wire loom. We're gonna run this cable right along here, just so the wire itself doesn't have too much exposure to the environment. Okay, this is called wire conduit. It's automotive. So I'm gonna put this stuff on just to make sure that the actual bare Starlink cable isn't exposed to all the elements um do i have to do this probably not but the underside of the trailer is going to pick up salt and snow and rain and mud and stuff so i'm gonna protect it okay so i've got <clears throat> i've got the conduit on and what i like about this stuff is it, it doesn't really crawl once you fix it in a couple spots, so I've just pushed it up here. Um, and you can see it's made a nice, satisfying, flush finish right up there against that cable clamp. So I think we have very nice environmentalization there. And now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow this propane line. Fred and I have finished running the wire. This is going to be my first cut. We'll see how this goes. Um, I'm going to carry the excess right here on top of the tanks. These wires are not energized. And um, this is the extra 75 feet of dishy cable. Dishy's right here, so obviously you can see I don't have to go far. But if I do end up using the alternative mounts, I may want to string this out somewhere. So, and Fred and I left we ran this in the uh, wire bundle um, harness, you know, this stuff, uh, all the way from the subfloor along the frame rail. We followed the line up into here. And uh, we'll see how this goes. So um, if, uh, if I like it, then it stays this way. If I turn out, I'm, um, I don't like having the wire interfering with when I have to change the propane uh, cylinders, then, um, you know, in a future video, we'll come to you live with um, uh, you know, cutting this cable and putting in some uh, bulkhead connectors, but we're gonna see how it goes for the summer. There you go, dishy installed. Okay, this is gonna be a real live video conference with Fred. Hey there. Hey, oh, I got you now. How's the sound? So I can hear you perfectly good. Perfect. So um, I was explaining to our viewers here um, that we're doing, I think, about a 600-mile round trip in order to do a video conference when you're, what, about six feet away? <laughs> yeah, six to eight feet, I would say, <laughs> so, through a concrete wall. We're going, we're going through uh, satellites and around the Earth. So, um, all right, so uh, you were going to do a pitch. Uh, what, what's our next episode going to be about? It's going to be about... Puppies. Oh, puppies. Everybody loves puppies. Love puppies. Good. Okay. So, like, what kind of puppies are we going to do? Like, just everything? You know, puppies playing, licking. Uh, <laughs> running around, chasing each other. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Puppies, mountain bikes. Love it. All right. So, uh, your video and audio quality is stellar. So, um, how's mine on your side? 
everything is good. Um, got a nice, great view of the uh, back of, your, of the airstream uh, from my uh, camera view here, and uh, well, everything looks really good. That's incredible, and uh, beautiful video quality here. So, it works. It works. Yes. <laughs> okay. Bye. All right. See ya.